Um, I've been thinking a lot about this topic of the modern family, for, and I've been thinking about it for quite a bit, and I guess we're going to have a larger discussion, but the only thing that I really want to suggest to you is that I believe that the modern family carries within it an ancient family. And that's really important to me. So, and the thing that I've been thinking about and the, over and over again is this poem by E.E. E. Cummings, that famous Korean. <laughs> it was from Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was born at the turn of the... <laughs> he's not Korean. <laughs> uh, he's, a, he's a perfectly lovely white guy who wrote a lot of really hot poems uh, at the turn of the 19th, at the turn of the 20th century. Anyway, um, and this one poem came to mind, and it's very, very brief, non-traditional sonnet, and I was wondering if I could, if you would humor me, and I could read this to you, and it's very short. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear. Whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. I fear no fate, for you are my fate, my sweet. I want no world, for beautiful you are my world, my true. And it's you are whatever a moon has always meant, and whatever a sun will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root, and the bud of the bud, and the sky of the sky of a tree called life which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that keeps the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. My father lost his entire family at the onset of the Korean War when he was a 16-year-old boy. And through hardship and through great adventures, he actually put himself through college, and he married a preacher's daughter. I'm one of three girls in my family. I'm number two. And in 1976, we immigrated to this country, and English is my second language. And I came when I was seven years old. Now, I want to jump way ahead to 2001, when I've had my own family, and I was living downtown near Chinatown. And my son, Sam, who was three years old then, and I were home when the towers fell. And Christopher, my husband, who's here right now, <laughs> finally got here who had to walk home from his office in Midtown. And Sam and I waited. And while we waited, I packed all the things that we needed in two light suitcases. Our passports, my son's birth certificate, our marriage certificate, and any jewelry or any cash that we had in the house. And I packed it all up with all the light clothing, as well as a warm coat for everybody. And I was preparing for war. Ten years later, I was in Tokyo, where I was living and researching my upcoming book. And in 2011, I was at the grocery store, and the Tohoku earthquake took place. I saw the parking lot asphalt rise like tall waves, and cars being lifted, and people being moved. And I couldn't reach my husband. And my son, who was in middle school then, was at school. And he was an hour away by car. And I ran home. And I did what I did the first time in 2001. I filled the bathtub. I packed our bags. And I got ready. I am the daughter of a war refugee. I am the granddaughter of a Presbyterian minister. And though I am a decidedly modern person, I carry within me my father's heart and my grandfather's heart. And they tell me to take care and to pray and to trust. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> So uh, family is intense. That is <laughs> how I feel as well. Um, and I actually 
have a lot of thoughts around this idea of family, the modern family. My parents uh, came from Bangladesh in 1978, and I was born in Illinois, um, and my sister soon followed in Texas. So we are American-born spawn of two Bangladeshi immigrants who came after a very deadly war in their country. So I think for me, growing up in my family, it's always been about the fight that we have for all of us to have our voice and our place. And for me, um, a lot of my struggles with them uh, was focused around my Muslim identity, which I rejected and resented as a child because I didn't want to follow a prescribed faith. Uh, my sexuality, uh, my sister, similar thing. So I think for us, we've had this sort of battle of wills in our family, and we're a feisty, fighting family, and we're very loud and rambunctious. So to me, that's kind of what I think of when I think of family. It's kind of like a cacophony of voices, and everyone is struggling to get heard. Um, but I think that as I get older, and I relate to my parents who are aging as well, um, I actually think of the election and where we all were during this crazy election. And none of us were together, and that felt significant to me. Um, my father was upstate in his house. My mother was in Bangladesh with her mother, my grandmother. I was in Brooklyn, my sister was in Harlem, and we were all in real time texting and like <coughs> talking about how horrible this could all be for us as this like, unified unit and our people um, from coming from this Muslim country. So I think. That is something that I always think of when I think of my family, is that we're often apart, we're often physically apart, we have our own lives, and we are not always on the same page. Um, but when it comes to these moments of strife and struggle, we do band together. Um, so I think for me, the modern family does have this ancient family in the root of it. I love that idea. It's like the core of us is this ancient family, I think, but I struggle to be who I am with this family. And I, they, I was born to them um, somehow by the grace of the universe. And I, you know, have resented that. I've loved that. I felt lucky for it. I've been ashamed of it. I mean, I felt so many different things within this one, not static, very vibrant group of people that I, I belong to who I call my own. Um, and now as, a, you know, I've kind of come to this new place, I have this new person in my family, he's here too, my partner is here too, but you know, I'm growing my heart and my family um, with someone else. So I think that's something that I want to always uh, engage in, is how can I keep pushing the bounds of who I am with the people that I call my family, and not stay static, and not just say that's just how we are. Um, and it, it's still political struggles and talking about who we want to be with and what we are, and I think that's something that I really engage my parents on who, if they had their way, I would have been married 12 years, 15 years ago. And, you know, like, I would have been with like a Bangladeshi Muslim person. So I think that's their narrow idea of what they came here with. Um, and they've expanded that. So it's just seeing my mother as a woman who's opening and changing and the vulnerability that we share with one another, I think is not exactly the vulnerability that I grew up with because I love you didn't come easy to them when I was little, but now we're all about, hey, I love you, you're amazing. You know, we're always saying that. And I, just talking to my mom, she sent me a photo of her in my grandmother's arms, and their eyes are closed. And my grandma's very sick right now. So just seeing her in her mother's arms as a child, it just, like, she became this fully realized woman, daughter, child being and she looks so beautiful and, and she's like please don't share this on social media i feel very <laughs> private about it i was like i would never um <laughs> just she doesn't have to say that because she's all about facebook um and i you know i realized that through technology she's very present to me even though she's in bangladesh and i can't get away from her but i don't want to get away from her because she is away from me um and seeing that picture seeing my grandma become more childlike and my mom become more childlike i felt like our eternal child, kind of, we were all bonded in that moment through that photo. It was, it was really beautiful. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's all about playing different roles, you know, in the family. And it's very dynamic. Um, and it's painful, and it hurts a lot, too. I feel like I've been hurt a lot by my family. And those are just some of the things I want to get into, is that it's not this static, happy notion of people wearing masks and being like, 
hi, Jenna, hi, Mom. Like, it's not like that. So I, I definitely want to explore that today. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> wow. <laughs> um, this is great. I, I, I'm really glad that uh, Min went first, actually, because um, I sort of get to say that, um, so I'm also one of three girls. I'm also the granddaughter of a Presbyterian minister, <laughs> and we're both Korean-American. But we're actually the same person. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a, it's like sl- <laughs> double vision. <vision-y. laughs> She's much more um, slender. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, what I get to say is that um, what I'm going to say about family is totally different from what Ben said. Like could not be more different. And I love that because you know we're living in a world where people are now kind of being grouped together in big masses and labeled, and um, that's too easy to do. So um, so but what I want to what I'm going to do, I'm going to say a little bit about just what I think about family. I'm going to talk a little bit about Mad Men. <laughs> and then I'm going to just say a little bit about how some of this um, comes, kind of manifests in my two novels. Um, so these two, uh, uh, these two phrases I think are very, I think are, are common and well known, especially in a place like New York where a lot of us are away from our families. Um, family of origin, family of choice. Those mm-hmm. expressions sound familiar. I, I know, like, for instance, in the LGBTQ community, it's very, those are very common expressions. Like your family of origin, your family of choice, the family you make, the family you came from. Um, so I live very much in that um, way of thinking. Um, and I would, uh, the, I would take it one step further. I'd say that I think of family as a verb, not a noun. I don't really like to think of family as a noun, as like a thing that you are. Um, I think of it as the way that we behave toward one another or the things that we make with people. Um, and I, that, uh, that seems like a pretty simple idea, and I know it's pretty commonly held, but I feel so strongly about it that I, you know, people really would disagree with me on that, I think. You know, that blood matters. Family is a thing. It matters just for what it is. Um, but in my experience, I've, I've just come to a place in my life where I'm not... I don't, I don't do that. Like I just, I, I sort of bring um, that writing maxim into my idea of family. Show, don't tell. Show me what family is. Don't tell me that you know, I'm family. Um, and some of that has to just do with the family that I come from, which I'm not going to talk about. In the interest of time, I decided I wasn't going to talk too much about my personal family life, but that I'm happy to during the Q&A. It's all fair game, so <laughs> feel free to ask. Um, so family is a verb, not a noun. It's something we do. It's something we make. It's not just a thing that is. And because I think I think that the noun form of the family, and this is a little bit to what you said about family is hard and it's you know it can be harmful sometimes, um, is that it's a really fundamentally conservative idea. This monolithic idea of family because it requires a kind of a buy-in to a, to a thing, something preconceived that. The conceivers of that thing are interested in preserving and keeping static. <laughs> um, and so I, f- I find that notion of family destructive and not one that I care to participate in. Um, so Mad Men, really quickly. Uh, I write for the millions. I've written about Mad Men. Um, I, I hope there's at least a critical mass of you who watch the show and are familiar with it at least a little bit. And if you're not, I hope that what I have to say might um, might uh, prompt you to check it out, or at least check out this this part of it. So, last it's the final season of Mad Men. How many years was it? Seven, six, seven. It was about halfway through. They did the, the finale in two parts. This is the end of the first part of the finale. And there are these three characters: Don, Peggy, and Pete, who we've been with for seven years, and we've known them, and we've known how they've interacted, and they, all kinds of shit that's gone on between them and apart. And they're sitting at a burger restaurant. Mm-hmm. I know that theme, yeah. <laughs> um, and they just happen to be there together working. Um, they're thinking about the, you know, how are they going to pitch the burger chef this restaurant? How are they going to pitch it? What's the tagline going to be? They're trying to figure it out. Um, and Peggy says, um, what if there was a place where there was no TV and you could break bread and whoever you were with, that was family. Um, and it becomes their advertising tagline. Um, But for me, as a watcher of the show, having seen these three characters go through so much, and I knew all their secrets, and they knew each other's secrets, and they had so much going on with each other, to be sitting there together talking about this idea of family, it's like this was when the show as entertainment, 
just like jumped, it just transcended. It like became art. It became about something for me. Because I just felt like those three characters, those three people who like Don's whole love life was in the shits. Um, <laughs> Peggy was like hanging out with a 10 year old in her apartment <laughs> who also had just abandoned her. And Pete's ex-wife had just told him you can never see your child again. So their families were all in disaster, but they were sitting there, the three of them, and they just, they knew everything about each other. Um, and it just, it felt to me like that's what Mad Men was about. Like it was about the destruction and recreation of families and family as well. Um, so, uh, so that was something I, I had written about at one point. Um, and I just wrote really quickly about the two novels. So Long for This World was my first novel. Um, and I would say that the way that these ideas about family manifest, it's all in retrospect, because when you write your first novel, you have no idea what you're doing. You're not really thinking about anything particularly consciously, I think, or I wasn't. Um, it was all very exploratory about kind of the family I didn't have, um, the family that wasn't sort of happening in this conventional kind of perfect way for me personally. So there was a very strong father-daughter relationship in that novel. Um, there was connection to the native land family travels back to Korea and connects with uncles and aunts and people. Um, there's a brother, there's an older sister, younger brother relationship that's very close. All things that I don't have in my family, actually. So, so that's what novel number one was sort of about for me, is exploring a little bit of wish fulfillment, too, I think, mm -hmm. sort of what, what could have been. Um, and just getting into the, the complexity of what's underneath kind of the face of a Korean family, which can be very proper on the outside. And then in my second novel, which just came out, um, I was much more explicit about exploring and, and going there with this idea that family is a verb. Family are the people that you um, create and, and love actively. So the loved ones, it's called the loved ones. And I very intentionally wanted to kind of interrogate and open up that phrase because that's a very um, Hallmark card, health insurance kind of expression, right? Your loved ones, your family. Um, and the novel's really about people who shouldn't love each other, uh, but do, and about um, characters who kind of fail to love the people they're supposed to love um, in the common notion of family. Um, so yeah, so, was, and as far as just the kind of where this all comes from, personally, um, I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I <clears throat> loved that scene in Mad Men that was, I mean, it was one of those moments of like, oh, this redefines family in this purely visual way. I want to talk a little bit about um, the function of fiction and how that uh, plays into all these ideas of, of family. Um, and I've thought about this in a lot of different contexts as well. I, I teach cultural studies and I have three small children and I, I was just on a panel at my son's elementary school about pluralism and um, in families. And um, I keep coming back to that essay by David Foster Wallace about television, where he talks about how fiction writers are all, we're all kind of weird. And we are just kind of all, you know, outsiders in some ways. And we need television because television tells us what normal is, right? <laughs> like it tells us what we're trying to be as, you know, what, what our culture values as normal. And I bring it back to literature in terms of um, where I think that's really needed is children's literature, right? Because what, if you look at children's literature, and I read a lot of it because I have children, and it's, um, that's telling you what normal is when you're very young, right? So when we look at families that are represented in children's literature, it's they're white, they're a, man, a mother and a father, usually siblings, occasionally there's something awesome like Llama Llama Red Pajama, where there's a single mom, or um, uh, what are some other good ones? Uh, but all of the LGBT ones, all of them, are about like Johnny has two moms, and here's him on page two having two moms, and here's him on page three having two moms, and look, it's normal. And that to me is the opposite of normalizing it, right? It's like coming at, at it from the angle of, I know you think this is weird, but I'm trying to convince you it's normal, right? So, and what's missing in those books is narrative and story. And that is, I think, something that we really need just to normalize um, families that aren't the norm. Um, <clears throat> and then what I think adult fiction can do is create 
new realities. And a book that I think about a lot in that regard is Hania Yanagihara's A Little Life, which has everyone read that book? Because if you haven't, go read it like <laughs> instantly. Um, where you have, like you're reading the book and it seems like a reflection of your reality and then suddenly you're halfway through the book and you're like, wow, they're all adults and none of them have had children and it's not an issue, right? Like nobody's saying, oh, shouldn't we have children? Or, you know, don't you wanna have kids? Maybe we should get married and have kids. Like it's just not talked about and that is creating a new model of what a family is. And again, that's a, a model of um, family that you make. Um, so I think that's, I was, I was coming at this panel as, as like what can fiction do to, to sort of reflect um, the reality of, you know, a, a multitude of families. And um, that's of course what I want to do in my fiction, but I think that's the power of fiction is that it, it you know, in some ways it, it reflects reality, but in other ways it can actually create mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start by asking, and Sonia, you touched on this. Um, to what extent is your work autobiographical or influenced by your personal identity? <laughs> so should we go? We'll go around the table if that's okay. Oh, sure. Um, actually, it's not autobiographical at all, her work. Uh, but parts of it are autobiographical, and I think the things that are very, very autobiographical for me are the emotions. Like, I have worked for, golly, this is so embarrassing, 30 years to produce two books. And I've had so many rejections and failures. And I think that in that process of those three decades, I have felt a lot of, a lot of shame. And I write a lot about shame. I write a lot about failure. And I write a lot about regret and self-doubt. So those are probably among my themes. So even though, and I think the other thing that I'm very autobiographical is I'm very interested in history. Mm -hmm. I'm also very interested in Freud and psychology. So you'll see a great deal of psychology informing the scenes of my work. I never talk about it explicitly, but it's something that I'm very conscious of. So in that sense, it's very autobiographical. Mm -hmm. well, I also do not think my work is autobiographical <laughs> because that would be boring to read. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't be boring to read, but I'm not writing a memoir until my family is gone. <laughs> um, I write about things I'm interested in. I'm into a lot of different things. And I think that's what, you know, I'm passionate about botany. I'm passionate about the city. I'm passionate about, like, queer culture and my friends and sex and, uh, like, everything that I want to write about, it goes into what I'm writing about. And I think my issue is, like, I have so many things I want to write about that it's, like, finding the vehicle within the characters to let them embody it. And I think part of that is, like, working through some archetypes that we all kind of work with, you know, as writers, and letting those archetypes breathe and be animated in people who are not us. But each of those people is, you know, kind of born of a kernel of me, perhaps, in my imagination, that then becomes their own life. So it's literally like having these people in my head for, you know, 10 years mm -hmm. that won't go away. And then, I don't know, I remember like, my partner and I were walking in Brooklyn and my book was published, ready to go, and I just started crying and I was like, they're gone, I don't feel them like taking over my mind anymore. <laughs> and he was like, are you sure about that? I was like, yes, I'm positive, like I don't feel it. And I felt like that disappearing ghost moment or whatever mm -hmm. in, a, in a movie. So I, I don't know if they're me, but they're like what I'm working through and grappling with and interested in and passionate about. Um, so that part is out of there. Um, so again, the, the first book was like autobiographical, like in a Rorschach kind of way. Mm -hmm. It was just all the kind of family relationships I was interested in exploring. Um, and the second book, I think, is, is autobiographical again, and just in exploring that passion I have for what it means who your loved ones are, and um, pursuing that even um, into taboo territory or unconventional territory. Um, and both books, interestingly, now that I think about it, they have these nuggets of like actual autobiography. So like Long for This World started with an aunt of, that I met in Korea the first time I went to Korea. And she showed me around and she didn't speak any English at all and my Korean is not very good and she just seemed mysterious to me. And so I, I kind of 
started writing that part of that, the family of that novel from her. Um, and with the loved ones, um, I've told this story a few times, but I, I had just failed to write a whole novel <laughs> and put it in a drawer and was starting this. And so I started with a character who was my age in the mid 80s in the Washington DC area, which is where I grew up. So I just had like a nugget of something that was like actual from my life to start with because I needed it. But then the rest sort of um, went off. And I agree that I think we put a piece of ourselves in all the characters, even the ones you wouldn't think we're in. Even the awful Definitely. ones. Yeah. Especially like the awful ones. Violence. And, <laughs> like, and, and we yeah. might be less in the characters that you would be, um, you would tend to associate us with mm -hmm. as well. So funny, I thought you weren't allowed to ask that question. <laughs> Fiction writers, like the. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I thought, yeah, you know, I thought that was pretty awesome and bold. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> I, um, I tend to start with one piece of something that's from my life, like setting, but then throw completely different characters into it. Um, or I, I'll take a character I know and sort of throw them into like a completely different, you know, maybe family or something um, that uh, mixes it up in ways that, you know, bringing together two things that I think are interesting. Mm -hmm. But I will totally deny that any of my work is autobiographical. <laughs> just, just gonna say that. Um, so, so Alden, you mentioned book. children's books, and I'm interested in knowing if the books that you read growing up influenced you writing about families or family units, um, whether it was the presence or absence of books that explore subjects, these subjects that interest you. Are we doing this again? Yeah, I mean, whoever wants to go first can go first. Um, I didn't speak English until I was about, well, I came when I was seven and a half, so it was really tough. And um, I spent, and we didn't grow up, we didn't have much money, so my primary form of entertainment was going to the Elmhurst Public Library where the librarians were incredibly kind to me. And I read through everything. And because, and I've mentioned, some of you know this, but I had a public speaking problem where I really didn't talk until high school. And I had to take a lot of public speaking classes and be coached because I was so terrified of speaking in public. But one of the reasons why I learned how to do it is because I figured that in America, if you don't talk, they think you're dumb. So I forced myself. But anyway, going back to this reading is that I really learned how to talk from books. So I, I, so I learned how to talk from reading children's books. So I read Little House in the Prairie, Betsy Tacey, a lot of really classic children's literature. And then I, I just read all through 19th century European literature. And I kind of thought it made sense to me because Korea is so class stratified and because Europe is so class stratified, if you read 19th century literature, it actually seems almost the same. And that's pretty much what I'm influenced by. Mm -hmm. So children's books, I, I, it's so funny. I was like thinking of teen years, but then I was thinking of my like young children favorite book is A Chair for My Mother. <coughs> I don't know, do you guys remember this mm -hmm. book? It's this kid who loses everything in a fire in a New York City building and then has a jar and puts pennies in the jar so she can buy her mom's a flat floral chair for her mother. It's like the best book. I <laughs> highly recommend if you have children in your life, you like get this book. But I remember that book being like such an archetype for that kind of familial devotions, you know, that I kind of explore, I think, in fiction. So I think that's a kernel of it in there. Um, but I definitely loved some smutty stuff when I was younger too. Like I read V.C. Andrews, like yeah. these families are messed up. Like everyone is literally with their brother by the end of it. And you're like, this is horrible. So I think I was really drawn to like how messed up family could be mm -hmm. um, and how dark and crazy and scary that world is. So I think mm -hmm. that interests me. Stephen King I love. So I read a lot of kind of bad things. But then I also, not Stephen King's not bad actually. I take that back. But <laughs> We'll see. Um, but I also loved, you know, kind of thinking about like Little House on the Prairie, the Laura Ingalls Wilder kind of frontiers family, like the family that like loses the sister and then the family is kind of trying to struggle in this unknown land. So I think that kind of people being um, flung far from what they consider home mm. to create their family, I'm very interested in that conceptually. 
Um, so I think, you know, through fiction, you can kind of tether people to a home base. And I'm, you know, in my novel, it's all about finding found family because um, the young women are exploring their sexuality and it's a, a range of Muslim identity. But it's also kind of, there's very uh, specific home bases. So there's this home on Cambridge Place in Fort Greene. There's this uh, oils and incense shop on Atlantic <laughs> Avenue. There's uh, the barber shop where everyone gets their hair cut. There's a threading salon. You know, so it's like places of commerce and like immigrant hustle that are where you create family. So I think that's, I don't know how it connects to children's books, but that's what I'm interested in is like creating the family in the hubs that we mm -hmm. center in our, in our lives. Um, so we didn't have books at all. <laughs> really? And there was no reading in our house. Uh, my parents didn't, English wasn't their first language and they weren't readers. Um, it just makes me just realize what a miracle it is that I like made yeah. one, mm -hmm. made my way to books and reading and words, and I teach in an English department, which is like a big hoax kind of. But <laughs> um, so I, I really learned learned to read. I mean, I read what was given me in school, so I read whatever was in school, but I didn't like really read like with like my whole you know passion. Yeah, yeah, like that. Oh, that book that just changed my life, or that I couldn't forget until. Um, Maybe toward the end of college mm -hmm. is when like yeah. real reading started for me. So, so you know, I just read Little Women for the first time <laughs> somewhere. Like there, are lots of I have lots of gaps, and I think it. But I think it's made me a really particular kind of adult reader. Like I, I just like when I read, I just don't take any of it for granted. Like I just, mm. I just get really, you know, and I read all over the place, and you know, there's nothing I won't read. Um, I, I would say maybe the thing that. Um, got from childhood or from the from the family was just the bilingualism right the language the movement of language always in the household you know my what my father did read religiously was time magazine Not with, a pen, with yeah. a pen and a dictionary a gigantic Webster's yeah. dictionary and he would like practice his pronunciation and look up words and um, so I think that's yeah that's most like that language from the family. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in a very sort of safe environment and a very suburban, um, everything's okay kind of environment. And I was always looking for extreme situations <laughs> in literature. I think we probably had a lot of similar reading material. Yeah, which is just like how horrible can <laughs> yeah, like be? Nancy yeah. Andrews or. But I, the first thing that I that I think really impacted me is a book I think no one no one's ever heard of called The Endless Step. It was my yeah. summer. Have you read that? I've heard of it. Okay, I think I, I don't even remember assignment. the author's name. Okay, I read that when I was going into fifth grade. It was my summer reading book, and it was about you know the child's perspective of being you know taken away to a concentration camp. Um, and I like I just never I just was like living it. I was like I would have brought soap. I would have brought you know I was just in there. Like what would I have done? And mom, like if we ever go to a concentration camp, like I was like really just imagining it so much that I feel, felt like I could inhabit that world. And I think. Um, that was what opened my world to beyond my environment, and that was what I think made me a good writer in the end, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but that made me attentive to other, you know, people outside of my own world. So building on that, I'm interested to hear what has inspired you all to write about families in your fiction. I think that I'm um, very distressed about the absence of Asian and and Asian Americans in media, in all forms of media. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, I have all these questions. And I think that people are trying to say now that we're post-racial, post-feminist, post-structure, post-everything. And post I guess, <laughs> post-truth. <laughs> that one's true. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm a throwback, but I still have all these questions about people like me. And I don't know if it's old fashioned, but I really want to know more about all these things that I didn't know about in English, because right now English is my primary language and there are all these histories and cultures that I don't know enough about. So that's what makes me write about family. And I don't really understand it when people write about individuals and isolation. I think that the quest novel is very important, but I think that the quest I believe, is very informed, whether you like it or not, by your history. Mm -hmm. I love all your answers, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just like, 
Um, I think for writing about family, for my first book, I wanted to write about a specific group of South Asians. I mean, people are familiar with South Asian literature from the 90s because mm -hmm. I was reading all these Indian writers mm -hmm. when I was like, mm -hmm. you know, a teenager in the 90s. But I'm not Indian, I'm from Bangladesh. Um, and I haven't really read that much about Bangladeshi American urban youth. And I feel like that's what I wanted to write. I wanted to write this world into existence that I actually hadn't encountered in fiction. And to me, I mean, the Brooklyn in the book and the bike rides crisscrossing through different neighborhoods of the city with these three young people who are Muslim people of the diaspora coming from all different, you know, kind of in their different part of their sexual evolution as young people. They're in a different stage of it. I really wanted to kind of give them the space to breathe in fiction. Um, and I also wanted to play with the idea of coming of age. Mm -hmm. I think the coming of age story and the family story are kind of intrinsically tied together, but I wanted to show a coming of age story for a 50 year old man and his 17 year old daughter and how this uh, repressed sexuality on his side and on her side is kind of like they're at odds with one another because he's supposed to be a father who is respected in the family, the patriarch, but he's a very floppy patriarch and his daughter is a very rebellious teenager which I was so I think for me it's a space of rebellion and resistance and like I was saying pain and anguish and all these emotions that I think that's what scars us and stays with us our whole life is our freaking family <laughs> like how do you not write about that? I just I don't know like I am like how do you just write about a person who's in the wilderness I don't know like I just don't do that um, because I think that that is an infinitely interesting gem you know like it's just to see how uh, someone like the mother character is a mother a lover a daughter a wife you know, it's just infinite like we're all so infinite and I think the family pits all these people against one another and that is also infinitely interesting to me mm -hmm. as a reader kind of just ditto ditto <laughs> that's why I feel about her too um, just like <laughs> yeah just uh, I mean in incidentally it's something I've noticed because uh, I teach college students is something that's kind of dismaying is mm -hmm. that um, many 19 year olds these days, like they, they love their families so much and they're so not fucked up by their families mm. that they don't have anything to write about. <laughs> and they, they find this whole body of literature that's about dysfunctional family and you know fathers and sons that hate each other and mothers that really make a mess, like really hard to access and they, they feel troubled by narrators who, you know, badmouth their parents and stuff, which mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so our generation, my generation, is doing, a, I guess, a good job parenting. Their <laughs> kids are really, they really love them. They, they're great. Um, but yeah, just the, I just say the complexity of family and um, the fact that families always look one way, but are, if you just dig into each individual, like there's the family and then there's each individual kind of, point in the family and just the way um, all that happens under the surface is just endlessly complicated and interesting and I think I'm also being one of three girls and having us each be so completely different but grown up in the same family that idea always fascinates me like mm -hmm. what what's going on there with a family in mm -hmm. which theoretically we experienced the same thing but we totally did not experience the same thing mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting uh, my book is called Unaccompanied Minors. So the premise of the book is that they're all kind of without <laughs> families. And um, as I, I, when you asked the question, I was like, huh, how am I going to answer that? Because I didn't write about families, but I guess um, I really was writing about families because in each case, the parents had really let the, the teenager down, right? Like they were absent from their family because their families wanted them to be a certain way and they couldn't be that way, so they left the family. So really, in, in essence, it is about, about family. And they're all very, very troubled people. So <laughs> that's its own comment. And really, what I was trying to explore was um, what happens when you are just yourself? Like, what happens when you, you know, go out on your own before you're like, really prepared to do that just so you can be yourself? Mm -hmm. And so you know, the results are good and bad. So Mindy touched on this. Um, but what 
what kind of family units do you think need better representation? I know that's a big question because there's a lot, but um, better representation in contemporary fiction. Um, <clears throat> I think that this is a really exciting time for people of color. I do. Um, I do think that I'd like to see more things about um, different kinds of romantic affiliations. Mm. I find that gender ascribed or sexual identity ascribed relationships are in many ways limiting to the people who are in those groups. Mm -hmm. This is what I hear all the time because it's almost like saying just because you're gay it doesn't mean that you're all going to be monolithic. So I would like to see, and if, you know, if you're polyamorous, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many more things. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I would like to see is that for the worlds to intersect and collide more of different kinds of families. So even the, and also within the different constructions, just to talk about how we're still affected by traditional families and through our cultures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to see more diasporic work in conversation with each other. Like I've been so lucky this past year to get to know writers from Sri Lanka, from India, like from, you know, just people that are part of my larger human family and I'm just excited to read their work because we're like seriously writing different stuff. And I did this round table with uh, three other Asian writers and um, the things that we were all writing about are so different. I mean, it's just not like enough to kind of put people in their lane and say, this is what Asian American lit looks like. This is what queer lit looks like. This is what trans lit looks like. It's like not like that. There's intersectionality. Mm -hmm. So I just want to see more intersectionality in our fiction because it's 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 always bothered me when people are kind of like well it doesn't have to have meaning and you have to ascribe politics to fiction because that takes away from it and it's not about race and it's not about this but you try telling that to someone where their life is about all this shit you know that we're dealing with and it's like that's what I'm going to write about and I think I want to have the license to write that world and not have it be put into a category that kind of takes away from the nuance and complexity of that. I think that's, you know, easy for categorization purposes, maybe at the library or the bookstore or marketing or publicity or whatever. But I think in a lot of ways that has kind of created some sort of malaise in the reader too, because you come to think you understand all South Asian writing because you've read a few famous South Asian writers. Mm -hmm. And you can't. You can't possibly know that. You know, I can't possibly think you two are actually the same person <laughs> because you're not. I mean, your work is not the same. So I think that's something that, as people of color, we are often put into these narrow categories and that I want to see resisted at all costs. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, actually. I, I guess I would just say generally more um, more families outside of conventional nuclear family structures, you know, outside of the institution of marriage or outside heteronormative uh, shapes. Um, but I, I agree that I think that's happening. And I feel like I'm seeing it more. So, but that could just be my little corner of the world and what I choose to write mm -hmm. and read. So. I think we need to do much better with translation in this country. Mm -hmm. I think we would get a lot a lot of different kinds of families if we just would translate more literature into English and read it. I also think we have to look at genre. Like um, my book was, there was one reviewer named Penny who really disliked my book because she felt like, you know, the whole point was I, I understand the character is a lesbian, but she, she have to keep talking about it. Oh, my book's not for Penny. <laughs> what we need is a book about lesbians for Penny. Like, I feel like we need to take some of this stuff and make it, like, you know, some of the stuff that is very, you know, literary fiction is a very hospita hospitable place for a lot of the issues we're talking about, but popular fiction is not necessarily. So I think that's where we need to look. Mm -hmm. Something like, I mean, Amy Tan's Joy Luck Club, I think, was, like, revolutionary in the way it opened um, people's worlds who hadn't had, you know, any exposure to the Chinese experience. Um, <coughs> So things like that. I think we need. I think we need to look at genre a little mm -hmm. bit more. So like YA too. YA like definitely. Yeah. YA definitely. YA. For, I yeah. mean, but even when YA has a person, YA like, is riskier. Katniss I think. is a person of color, but not in the movies. Like mm -hmm. yeah. 
I feel like it doesn't get translated. Like, there needs to be more like cross that's a that's a Hollywood pollination of like what we're writing and television and film is so mm -hmm. exciting right now. So I think yep. I want to see more. I would love cross to see Asian people on TV yeah. more. <laughs> like, um, who do you think? Are, are there any particular writers that you would think are doing a great job of that right now of representing the kind of families family structures that you'd like to see more of? Or perhaps, you know, not necessarily contemporary writers even. Writers that you read, you know, in your literary careers as, or as your lives as readers. I love Juno Diaz, unequivocally. I think that his work is absolutely brilliant. And I think that he's really, really brave. Um, I think that Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye was a book that changed my life. And that's a very honest book about families. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are my two right now. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I've read so many books in the past few months um, that are debuts, and I'm really excited by debuts because I'm a recent debut, so still into it. <laughs> um, but yeah, Giassi is home going, so stunning, and family through time, mm -hmm. the human family. It, that stuff just makes me so excited <laughs> about fiction because you don't just belong to your family you belong to a billion mm -hmm. you belong to the world you know so I think that kind of um, work is happening with young writers and she's just one of them that I've gotten introduced to so um, I've just I'm writing about fathers and daughters in literature so that's what's like in my brain and what I've been reading so um, a novel by Francois Sagan called Bonjour Tristesse. I don't mm. know if any of you know it, but it's just like this really weird relationship between a father and a daughter and um, that I think is really fascinating because it doesn't judge it. At the same time, it's sort of, it, it's not an appropriate relationship exactly, but um, so, but it's, um, I just think it's really complicated and interesting. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, J.M. Kutzia's Disgrace. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that was really father good. Father-daughter yeah. relationship there. It's, it's just so complicated and difficult. Yeah. And, yeah, and um, what else? Oh, something that just came to mind and I don't remember why. Um, sorry, there was something I was thinking about that had something to do with that. <laughs> I think Michael Cunningham has always done a, a good job with family and different kinds of people within a family. Um, Lydia Yuknovich is a really interesting writer who's, who really shakes everything up and always including family. Um, I just read a really, really interesting memoir by Gerald Walker called The World in Flames, which is about growing up with um, African-American um, blind parents in a white supremacist doomsday cult. Interesting family. <laughs> wow. It was, if you liked the glass castle, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you'll like the world in flames. That's a great recommendation. <laughs> it just, I don't know if any of you will be familiar with this, but it's just made me think of the Dave Chappelle sketch. Mm -hmm. the, the blind, black, white supremacist. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> guy <his> character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought of the book I was thinking of. It's a debut. It's by um, a young... Um, writer named Rion Amakar Scott, oh, a collection of stories. Yes. Um, they're almost all about families. Yeah, insurrections. insurrections. Very good. Um, some of them are linked. It's like different members of the family show up in different stories. In there's a town. A, yeah. There's a wonderful father daughter. Mm -hmm. There's a mother. There's the son. Okay, so I'm just going to ask one more question and then we'll open up to the audience. Uh, I'm interested whether you feel a responsibility to portray people from particular backgrounds or with particular familial experiences. What do you mean responsibility though? Like as good or? I mean that's. Oh, okay, yeah, that's up to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that I have to say that I do. I really, really do. And as a matter of fact, I think my responsibility is to be honest about portraying an array of characters. And I think that it is fair to say that something is racist or not racist if there's only one portrayal of a minority person and that tends to be excessively good or excessively bad. So, magic. <clears throat> right, so you don't want to be the magical person of mm -hmm. color who could, you know, 
cast spells or something. In the same way, you don't want to be the, the horrible criminal either. So I do think about it all the time, but I have to confess that when you do feel the sort of ethical, political compulsion, it is actually inhibiting. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I have to think about all the time. Mm -hmm. It's such a negotiation of what you want. But you can never really, I mean, that's the thing. When you get bogged down with, like, your politics, it does bog you down. Like, I don't feel like, you know, to write about this war that my parents lived through, I had to do a ton of research and talk to survivors of war, go to Bangladesh. But how to <coughs> imbue the fiction with that imagery without bogging it down with this horrific, like, just horrible things that people witnessed. Um, not that you shouldn't write about those things. You should write about those things. But I really wanted to find um, a way to show it in a way that I hadn't seen before. So there's this one interview that I did with this old man who had lived through the liberation war in Bangladesh. And he was talking about the color of the sky when tracer bullets would fly through. And it would just turn this brilliant magenta color. And I just thought that was such a beautiful detail. Like, he had told me all this stuff, but the thing that really stayed with me was this color, magenta. Mm -hmm. And this area that I kind of went through, there was these guys, like, hacking watermelon, and it was like they cracked it open. It's like the color of the sky. And I was just like, you know, if watermelon season's in March, that's, like, when the war started. And it's just, like, these things that are serendipitous mm -hmm. when you're a writer, and it just turns you on. You're like, I have to write this thing. And it just makes you so excited. I don't know. Like, that's how I get where I'm like, serendipity is like what we're looking for. And that is your holy grail as a writer. So I don't know about responsibility. I wouldn't use that word because mm -hmm. um, I hate the word responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I believe in serendipity. So I feel like if I see a character that is in need of some facts that I have, I will give them the facts. <laughs> and like, hopefully it works out. But I, I just, I don't know. I like those connections that feel more mystical because mm -hmm. I think when you lose the mystical nature of writing it's just not fun and if you're not having fun in some way whether it's like being unbathed and you know like I haven't changed my outfit in four days and I don't pick up the phone when people call like that's to me like a good writing session mm -hmm. then you know like I just I'm not going to bog it down with what I think it needs to be it right. just needs to be mm -hmm. so so was the, was the question more about like responsibility to accuracy or responsibility to positive portrayals? Or I think more the latter. Positive portrayals mm -hmm. of certain groups of people. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. uh, no, I don't think we're talking about that responsibility. I mean, I feel what I, f and I wouldn't use the word responsibility. Responsibility doesn't quite resonate either, that mm -hmm. word. It's more like, I, r I mean, I think it doesn't feel like a burden because I think I write because, my drive to write is about complexity. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested that that's just why I write and why I read is I'm interested in complicated characters and what makes them tick. So mm -hmm. um, I feel like if I, if I stay true to that, then hopefully I'm being responsible. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I think for most of us, it's probably a natural extension of the way we live, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, it's important to me to think beyond my you know, especially in the ways that I'm privileged, like think beyond my experience, like in the way I live, just the way I go about my life and to acknowledge um, other experiences. So I think that naturally becomes part of mm -hmm. my fiction. Mm -hmm. And I def a famous writer um, who I won't name had made that interesting comment recently about, um, you know, I don't really write about race because he'd only written about white characters. Oh, yes, yeah. And <laughs> Then Twitter went crazy. Like, actually, that's that's you're writing about race right there, right? Like, so um, I don't want to write about race that way. And we're always writing about race. Like, that's to me, it's important, you know, just in all of my work, and just because I care about it mm -hmm. in life, to to make sure that I'm not just speaking from my own perspective. Well, thank you, and thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to. <laughs> If anyone has a question they'd like to ask, please go ahead and raise your hand. <laughs> I, I'm just curious because even though you're, you know, many of you aren't necessarily writing about your families, um, what's been your family's reaction <laughs> to your writing and how do you sort of negotiate that? Because I think that that's something that actually keeps some writers from writing. Definitely. 
Oh my gosh. I feel like I could talk about, I just, I deal with this so much with my family. I always have to call my mom to check in about an essay that's going to come out, but I, <laughs> like, you're going to cry. <laughs> but she's just like read my novel and loved it and was like able to be like, you're a fiction writer. Like, this is what you do. Like, this isn't us. So she had this great distance. But my father has been reading a chapter a year. I don't know. He's just like not able to look at it. Mm -hmm. I think he's too afraid to see me as this like fully realized woman who has these mm -hmm. like desires on the page and he doesn't want to know me like that. Mm -hmm. So he's like, that's gross. Like, I don't want to see you like that, but I love you and I'm proud of you and I'm sure this is great. But he just like can't deal with it. But then my mom is a blogger in Bangladesh and she has all these friends in her life who are aunties and the aunties love it. And then the uncles <laughs> do not like it. The uncles are like, this book is really like, why do you know these things? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm 35. Like, I don't know why I know these things. So I think it's like this community thing that kind of, they're excited because I'm Bangladeshi and they're like, we don't know any Bangladeshi authors like except you. And I'm like, well, then you need to read more. But they are excited in a way that I think allows them to be open. But my mom has been like 100% on my, on my team. Um, I like this question a lot, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like it a lot because um, I grew up in a fairly modest background, but also they, they didn't have a lot of money when they came to this country, but my parents are really, really intellectual and very literary. And I think people in this country often conflate lack of money with lack of intelligence. And my parents were reading, you know, Andre Gide and um, Baudelaire, and they just knew a ton of things and were always encouraging us to read. So even if we didn't speak this language, they wanted us to have this knowledge. And they were very curious about it. So both my parents have read both my books, and they've been so supportive, and it's really, really helpful. And they can tell the difference between fiction and nonfiction. And it's great because the censors that I have, I think that's what you're talking about, really. The censors that I have are really my censors about moral, moral um, and political responsibility. Because I definitely feel that. Because I do think, I read so much, and it's so unfair, the stuff that I see on television, in film, and in books. They're so unfair. So I feel like I do want to enter into a space and give greater complexity. But I love Alden's point about, which is a very generous thing that you just said, about there should be a book for Penny. <laughs> Even those who criticize us, there should be books for them. And I think that what's really nice about literature is that you don't have to sell a zillion copies to actually have a career. If this is not the only way you make money, you can actually sell 50 copies or 100 copies or maybe not even sell. You can, you can blog. You can do many things and share your point of view. And what's really nice is that you can find an audience because readers are so generous in that way. Um, I think my, my family still doesn't quite get what I do, <laughs> kind of, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, I mean, like, my mother, like, I love my mother, but she's just not a literary-minded person, she's just not a reader, she's read it, um, not the new one, I don't think, but the, the first book, and, and has said she's proud and all that, but, but can't really access the specifics of it. Um, I do have one sister who, and again, our family's not very, like, we don't sort of, you know, talk about stuff. So, but I have one sister who's like having this kind of uh, midlife, kind of midlife crisis, but where she wants to talk about everything. So she's been very supportive mm. of this latest <laughs> book, which has like some um, racy stuff in it. So. <laughs> My book of fiction also has a lot of racy stuff in it, and I was, um, and I love this question too. Um, I was very lucky in terms of my relationship with my parents that I first published a very intellectual travel memoir that they could give to their friends and say, look, <laughs> my daughter's a writer, and be really proud. And then when my book of fiction came out, they could be like, OK, you know, and kind of ignore it. And although they did, when I read here, they did come. And uh, the person that I was in, in conversation with was like, and the blowjob. I was like, no, no. <laughs> um, <Don't> uh, <laughs> Um, but my dad has never read the book, and he said flat out, he's like, I'm not going to read this yeah. book. And I was like, thank you. Please don't yeah. read this book. And that's fine. Right. You know, that works. That's how I, don't read it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love you. Don't read it. Let's just yeah. talk about right. some other NPR or something. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was working in the Tuba field, and I had zero 
your own inspiration for the second book. And I'm actually an Indian, born and raised in California, so I can relate to a lot of what you were saying. And my first book is My Brother's Journey about heroin addiction, which was a huge struggle as for an Indian family. And one of the things that I'm really struggling with for my second book is finding that fine line. It's interesting that we were talking about positive portrayal because I don't consider it negative portrayal, I consider it honest portrayal. How do you guys break that barrier between honest portrayal and disrespect? Do you feel it? Do you, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like how do you abide by the truth of this character versus making yeah. them look like all South Asian dads are like horrible people or whatever. Like I totally struggle to find that, I think, but I I want to hear what everyone else thinks, but I, I definitely think that being guided by the honest portrayal is mm. the right way to do it. I mean, definitely. if you think that it's, if you think someone is not doing enough, whatever that means to you, but they're not doing enough because they're somehow being, you know, fettered by the racial de racialized depiction or the class background you've given, or these other factors that create a character, I think the work you need to go back in, you meaning the general you, you go back in and you're like, is this how they would operate mm -hmm. in this situation? I think action is liberating for me as I used to do acting and it's always about action, where you came from, where you're going. And I think in terms of action. So if I don't know what they are thinking or in their inner monologue or whatever, you know, I go into what are they doing? And I think that actual physicality of what a person does with their hands and their movement and their body, that kind of gives you more of an honest portrayal of that person. And I think that does connect back to the choices that they're making. But it's all about giving your characters choice and room to breathe. So you could write about a white supremacist who does horrible things um, if you want to. But I think that that's scary terrain for people to enter. And I think if you're willing to go into scary terrain and enter it, you can do beautiful things with fiction. I mean, fiction is not about the good people who mm -hmm. save the world and do good things. I mean, that's like boring to read. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I don't even want to really read about people like that. So I think the dark side is where we're kind of, work, what we're working with. Um, but that balance is where I feel like I derive most of my clarity. Some of it is motive. Like if you're going to write a negative character or a flawed character or a, a troubling character, say you're going to write a, a school shooter or something, yeah. um, my guess is you're drawn to it as a writer because there's something interesting and human there, not because you want to write a story that, write something that condemns school shooters because that would not be interesting at all, right? So, that, so the motive there is, is going to kind of carry you into complex territory, I think. And then the other thing is just like what you actually believe as a person about other human beings. Like I don't, I think most writers who are writing literary fiction or literary memoirs don't believe that anybody is actually all yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if that's who you are and how you experience human beings, that will also um, come with you as you write the characters. First of all, congratulations. I think that's wonderful. Uh, it's difficult to do that. I So I wanted to give that moment to you. And then also, I want to encourage you to think about this idea. <laughs> because it really changed my life about public speaking. When I figured out that the audience is actually rooting for me and want to be entertained <laughs> and wanted me to succeed, they wanted to have a good time. Then all of a sudden, they change from becoming a censor or a judge to being my ally. Yeah. And I think that you're a reader, I'm a reader, I really want the book to be good, I really am rooting for the author, I know how hard it is, and I really try very, very hard to think about the fact that I'm writing for someone who loves me. It's kind of a nutty thing to say. But I often think of my sister who loves me, I think of my husband, I think of my son, I think of people who love me, and I definitely think there are pennies out there, but they're not going to love me anyway. <laughs> so, and Penny's going to and, and Penny's going to have her own writer, <laughs> but it's probably not me, and that's okay. And I think that once you sort of like give up the idea that everybody's going to like you, but most, but it just the overwhelming majority, most people are rooting for you. 
interesting how Penny, like, she I know really Penny. Hovers. Penny's really. <laughs> Penny for all writers, she kind of hovers in a There's way. There's this thing called there. bad reviews where authors go online reading out loud their bad reviews they've gotten. I read the review that Penny gave me. If you oh, want to really? laugh at a really bad review, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's legitimately funny to, uh, to read it. It didn't hurt my feelings at all, but Good. bad reviews. Um, I don't have anything to add on that topic except that I think, um, just to echo, you know, like, it's boring to read about black and white characters. Like, we want the complexity, so I think, you know, if you wind up moralize, like, using a character to moralize or, like, afraid to say something, you know, that casts someone in a bad light, it's probably going to result in less interesting characters. Hi. Um, I teach middle school, and I work with a lot of high school teachers, too. And so this question is particularly for Alden and Sonia. Um, one thing we are trying to balance in middle and high school is this idea that we want our curriculum to be a window and a mirror, in that like you see yourself in the curriculum, but it also shows you the world. Mm-hmm. And then so we have that on one side, and we also have this like obligation, or at least we feel we have an obligation to, like, give kids the canon and like that they won't be prepared for college if they're not reading this canon. So I just wonder in your experience like working with college students, how important you think that is? Like how do you balance these two? That's a really great question. I teach at a very um, uh, left-leaning college, Emerson College, which is an arts and communication school in Boston. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of debate about you know how much should we how much should we teach the canon? And I think, I think you're right. Um, that's my cousin, Sarah. I think you're right, Sarah. <laughs> um, <laughs> family. Um, it's like really like well revealed. Like, <laughs> I felt so anonymous. Like, you had no idea. She broke character. <laughs> we may have talked about some stuff before. I know her. Family. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think you are, you will be disenfranchised if you don't know the classics. Right, so it's about I think you know like knowing I think window in a mirror is an, an amazing way to look at it. It's like we want to, you know, sort of reflect our the experience of our student body, open their minds to new experiences outside of whatever the you know the zeitgeist is of the of the school, um, but also like make them part of the intellectual conversation that's been going on for you know many years about works of literature that weren't representative of you know anyone besides the hegemony, right, the, the dominant culture. So, um, so yeah, I think it's all about balance, and I think it's something that you definitely feel out with your individual school. I just, I, I get really, pu- like, flummoxed by conversations about the canon because it's like, what is that? And how can you, especially for middle and high school, like, if you have to pick ten books, like, how can you, how can, mm-hmm. what's a canon of ten books? Like, there are just so many books. Um, so I, I just, I just don't know. Like I don't even know. Like when you say canon, what you mean or what you mean, it just feels impossible to. You know, we have we do have these debates in the in the English department, like mm-hmm. coverage. You know, this idea of somehow giving it some kind of balanced. You know, what would be on that list? And I just, it just seems impossible to make that list complete. Someone's always going to say, mm-hmm. well, "What about this? But this is canonical. But this is indispensable." Um, so my answer is kind of lame, which is like it's, I say this to my friends who are parents who, who are really worried about being good, being bad parents, like they're gonna like mess it up. It's like, first of all, you're gonna mess it up, <laughs> but also if you're asking that question, like you're already, you're already good. Like if you're worried about you know those two things, and you're gonna try to come up with a list that's somehow with the greats and. Um, New stuff that re- represents our world, our contemporary world. Then, good yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> like you're already asking the right track. question. Are you teaching in New York or in yeah. which which middle school? Because I used to teach for like ten I years. Oh, which one? Like it's a, a charter school. Oh, it's a charter it's school. A yeah, I feel like I don't know. In high school, when you're teaching high school and middle school kids, like they really like reading about people who are like mm-hmm. them. And you need to remember that as a teacher, I think. Because I remember introducing Entezaki Shange's Her Colored Girls to my theater group when they were all in middle school. And they drank that, like, mana from the gods. Like, they just wanted to read and be these different women who embodied their community in some way, even though that book is from the 70s. So I think it's, like, 
I, I don't know. It's like at that age, you're so looking for these mirrors, mm -hmm. you know, such a narcissistic age in some ways that you should be looking for authors of color if it's people of color, black students, Latino students, authors who are black and Latino to, to reflect their world view, I think. I think that's important. I mean, you have plenty of time to read, like, Catcher in the Rye or whatever you're forced <laughs> to read. Because you're, try, you're, trying to, you're trying to hook them into re wanting to read, read it all. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Great. Any more questions? I'm a high school teacher, too. I feel that because we're putting so much emphasis on skill mm -hmm. that, for me, it kills me because we're not presenting the books like we want to. I want the kids to be able to read and discuss, have fun with now it's so skills driven mm -hmm. that first of all we're not even covering most of the material mm -hmm. we used to. So because of testing? Yeah, and all that too. It's ridiculous. But it's just I just feel like now if you really want to motivate children, you just have to find these visual clips, you have to find excerpts. Mm -hmm. You know, just give it to them that way. But education is being killed, and that's a reality. And then they go to college, and then the book titles are going to be thrown at them. So here they go from skills to going to college where they have syllabus, mm -hmm. read it, and write it. And there's such a disconnect. I think but I'm just wondering what's yeah. that going to do to their next generation. I yeah. share your concern as a parent. My son is 18, and I do think that one of the things that we're not talking about because it's not popular is the electronic screen syndrome. Mm. Mm. I think it's really, really, really horrible, and I kind of wish like there was something that we could do because the amount of um, time that I spent reading was because I didn't watch television, I didn't have other things. And especially for boys, I'm very, very concerned about what's happening with reading. Um, and I'm almost, even though, like, there's a party that just wants to say, you don't have to read my book in college if you promise you'll read Jane Eyre. I'm good. Like, as long as, like, I, I, because it's such an important book to me, I'm like, please do not make me a token into your list. Read Jane Eyre. I'm good. <laughs> that said, <laughs> I don't know if anybody has the attention span to read Jane Eyre anymore. And I'm totally honest about that. So whatever we can do to get kids jazz to read, and I, and I feel so sorry for... Um, all of my friends who are teaching from kindergarten all the way through university because I feel like they're learning how to tap dance to get the kids to pay attention. And I feel like parents are not, we are not cooperating with the educational system to say, you gotta put that phone down. You just got to. And we can't have kids really spending six hours a day on the screen and learning how to moderate the use of the screen because our brains are being rewired. Every research indicates this about young minds. So if our prefrontal cortex is not truly done by 29, good God, and we're starting it like at, at infancy. So, I mean, this is something that I feel like as a writer, whatever we can do to get kids excited, like if it's Suzanne, I can't remember her last name, um, Hunger Games. If the kids will, yeah, thank you. If, she, if they'll read it, I'm like, fine, read it, anything. Question really is a comment. This is just so interesting. Um, um, there's an NPO program recently where parents are discussing how you know how to get their children off, you know, unwired, and um, people talking about different methods, and they're also talking about family relations. So I love the tie-in here, um, and that and the um, you know modern the modern family. And there have always been problems in, in relation, family relations. But um, one man said that he noticed a funny thing happening when he, um, I don't know the word you're using, it, you know, unwired when he, you know, just spent a whole day or a weekend, he and his wife both in the house um, without going near their iPhones or even laptops or anything. They noticed their children playing with each other like they never did before. They noticed that they're, and they weren't they weren't trying to be model, they weren't really trying, you know, to be obvious. But they noticed that their children were playing with each other and having a good time. And um, and, and you know, everything was better. The 
the other thing, the other comment is um, I just kind of flash back to my friend who years ago adopted a 10 month old um, girl or two, daughter from um, Guatemala. And in this wonderful picture, my friend is a very, very bookish, she's a librarian, and she's just always, 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 you know, like this, with her you know, paper. I'm reading. And um, there's this wonderful picture of her profile. The girl is like, barely a year old and can barely walk or anything. And there's the mother reading the New York Times. It's a Sunday and the Times is all over the place. And, and it's a profile and here's this little, this little holy holy black mom baby with the New York Times like this. And she's just staring into it. And, and she maybe she was like 17 and you know, she, she's okay about it. Not really, but, um, so I don't know. What the educators are talking about is the fact that you need to have analog skills to succeed. However, the children are living in a digital world. So you're assessing children on analog skills when they're actually unfit because they're mostly skilled in digital media. And we are here interested in analog things. And I think it's troubling to us, but it's something that we have to keep pushing at. And I, and I really commend educators who are thinking about it fighting this battle is really hard.